What's up, beautiful ladies and handsome men? I am not sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to it. What's up, my beautiful and handsome people? This is Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. And today, we're gonna talk about the woman who filled the screen with her very sassy, very funny, diva-like behavior, honey. Miss Nell Carter. Let's get to it. Nell Ruth Hardy was born on September the 13th, 1948 in Birmingham, Alabama. And she was one of nine children born to Edna May and Horace Hardy. Now it seems that right off the bat, Nell faced trouble in her life. It is claimed that uh, one day while she was two years old, her father took her out to play and I guess to spend some time with her, but he ended up stepping on a power line. Horace instantly became frozen and the current was much too strong for him to survive. So he died right in front of Nell. And although Nell was only two years old and she probably didn't exactly remember the episode of her father passing away, just the knowledge of knowing while she was a child, her father died in front of her, that was enough to possibly affect Nell in negative ways. And I cannot confirm that, but while I cannot confirm that it affected Nell, I can definitely say that gossip claims that it affected her mother terribly. Her mother was pretty much, you know, kind of left to raise nine children on her own, and she became very bitter because of this. Gossip claims that Edna May really turned into a hard woman, you know what I mean? She really became no nonsense. And one of the things that she definitely did not play about was the church church and her children, her nine, better had they behind in the church. And not only should they be in the church, she fully expected for her children to participate in church activity. And one of the things Nell was supposed to do was sing with the church choir and Nell did do this. And Nell actually found that she liked singing with the church choir because the little girl was very good at it. Let me tell you how good her little tail was. She was so good that soon she started singing over the radio for a local gospel channel. And little Nell Hardy became a local star in Birmingham. Now, Nell ended up liking this singing thing so much that she wanted to take it a little further than just at church. So around 14 years old, she ended up starting to perform at local hangout and put on shows for small crowds. And then when she was around 15 years old, she joined a troupe called the Renaissance Ensemble. Now, I got a feeling that Nell's mama probably didn't really know what Nell was doing when she was with the Renaissance Ensemble because it's claimed that Nell's little tail was out singing in gay bars and I just cannot imagine that her mother very God fearing and church going you know was going for no uh, stuff like that but regardless if her mother agreed or if her mother even knew about it, Nell kept doing what she was doing. In fact, she was eager to be in every performance because see, by this time, Nell had made it up in her mind that she wanted to be a singer, an actress, some sort of entertainer. And then on the night of July 5th, 1965, she was performing with her ensemble and I think they were performing at a cafe. Well, Nell killed it as usual and after the show, she was looking for someone to take her home. And it just so happened this man that she had known for a while possibly all of her life was actually at the performance and he offered her a ride home and so Nell thanks him for his kindness and she jumps in the car and while they are on their way home they are joking they are laughing they are talking <laughs> head leaning back no worries in the world then child one of them times she threw her head back to laugh baby her head got froze back there because underneath her chin she felt the cold muzzle of a gun honey Nell stopped laughing too fast so Nell starts whimpering and starts pleading for her life and this guy tells her to shut up and and if she didn't obey what he told her to do, he would blow her brains out. And then this guy, who like I said before, was a grown man, told Nell that he wanted her to take off all of her clothes. And of course she complied because she was scared and he ended up sexually assaulting her. At this time, Nell is only 15 years old. Now I'm not sure if Nell told her family about the assault as soon as it happened, but I do know that sooner or later she had to say something because Nell's stomach was swelling. Yes, honey, the most horrible thing that could have happened, happened and Nell was pregnant with her attacker's baby. And this is devastating news for Nell because for one, she is a teenager. She is nowhere near married. And then, uh, hello, she's pregnant by her attacker. So all of this is playing on her mental. She's afraid, she's upset, she's depressed. And then also a lot of judging eyes and a lot of judging tongues start to wag because she is a pregnant teen. Child, the streets say there wasn't nobody judging Nell harder than her own doggone mama. Baby, gossip claims there was a whole bunch of, you ain't nothing but a fast tail heifer. Baby, it's alleged 
Janelle had to put up with all kind of foolishness from her mama about their doggone pregnancy. And then when she had the baby, which she named Tracy, supposedly the uh, judging nature was still going on. And on top of having to deal with this from her mother and other people, Nell was having a very hard time raising this child. I mean, she just felt like she could not do it. She was not equipped for this. And so luckily, an elder sister named Willie stepped in and told Nell that she would raise the child. And when Nell gave her baby up, instead of her doing something like going to get a fast food job or working at a local grocery store or doing something very fast to end up getting on her feet to get her child back, Nell figured that she still wanted to live her life. She still wanted to live her dream. So she ended up uh, continuing to sing with the Renaissance Ensemble. And then when she was around 18 or 19, she traveled with the Renaissance Ensemble up to New York. And when Nell gets there, honey, her eyes are open to some of everything. She experiences a whole new life. And so Nell kisses that little country girl living goodbye. She does not want to be that any longer. She now wants to turn into a city girl. She just like how fast city living was. Everybody could just be themselves. And not only that, it seemed like everybody around her was wanting to pursue something in the entertainment industry. You know what I mean? You had big theaters over there. You know, you had actors that actually lived there. It just seemed like a lot of opportunities. Opportunity. And so Nell decided to pursue her dream full time. She wanted to sing. She wanted to act. Like I said before, she just wanted to be an entertainer. And so she decided to live in New York permanently. And not only did Nell realize that Alabama wasn't going to cut it for her to become a big time entertainer, she also realized that the name Nell Hardy definitely wasn't going to cut it. She needed a more glamorous last name. And so that is when she renamed herself Nell Hardy. Carter. This new Miss Nell Carter stepped out on her own away from the Renaissance Ensemble and she started booking small solo gigs at coffee shops and cafes. And with a voice like Nell's, it was not long at all before people started to notice. And before you know it, all types of people wanted to attach themselves to this new and up and coming entertainer. So Nell started to get plenty of folks all in her ear, you know, telling her she should do this telling her she should do that. And one of those people actually said, hey, I can get you an audition with Broadway. Now that right there, Nell actually listened to. Nell thought of her name and those big bright lights and she started going to audition after audition. And I'm not exactly sure how many auditions she went to, but I do know in 1971, Nell landed her first Broadway role. And that was in a rock opera called Soon. Oh honey, Nell was uber excited about this opportunity and she got on that stage and she rocked it but unfortunately nobody was there to watch those performances and the production closed after only three shows and of course Nell was not happy with this but she kept showing up for casting calls she kept showing up for uh social events for actors and kind of just kind of stayed in the mix and in 1974 it paid off in a big way Nell Carter found herself acting alongside a heavyweight baby I'm talking about a big deal and if you think I'm lying baby I'm talking about Betty Davis baby a real life heavyweight Nell got her chance to act with Betty in a stage production called Miss Moffat and you talking about bringing it baby she was splendid in the part that she had and all of the people in the audience talked about what a great experience they had whispered and cooed and ah about how wonderful Nell was and when the lights came up all three of them stood up and gave Nell a rapturous applause and I'm exaggerating about the three people, but honey, for real, it was not much more than that in that doggone audience. Wasn't nobody there to see that doggone play. Even with Betty Davis in the cast, still did bad. Did so bad that the show ended up closing before it even made it to the Broadway stage. And I know Betty Davis was shamed because honey, she thought her name had meant something and maybe it did, but the folks weren't checking for her at that time. Again though, Nell Carter did not worry too much because if nothing else, she had her attitude and personality personality to fall back on. And at this time, it is claimed that Nell had a very bright, very sunny disposition all the time and people love to be around her. And then she also had a knack for being very serious about her work and getting the job done. And her efforts were recognized, which is why 
Sky, also in 1974. She was named musical director of Westbeth Playwrights Feminist Collective's production of What Time of Night It Is. This was a huge bump on Nell's resume and assured that her name would start reaching even higher levels and start going around in even more prestigious circles. And because of the fact that she had been named musical director of something, her auditions became much easier. That's even if she still had to audition. She had now kind of gotten to that level where her name started to carry a little weight, especially around the theater circuit. So Nell was climbing the ladder slowly but surely. And I'm sure she was appreciative of that, but wouldn't you rather climb the ladder quickly but surely? Of course you would, and Nell felt the same way. You know, she was glad that she was gradually moving up, but she wanted something to kind of blast her into stardom. She was ready to get there now. And then something that was more of Nell's speed came around. Something that was still a stage play, but had always been an historically black stage play. The type of play where Nell's voice, as well as her looks, would be fully appreciated. You know, because she had sang in soon the rock opera, but that's rock, you know what I mean? That's geared to more white songs. Well, this new play was going to be geared to more black music, more black songs, where Nell could truly shine. And the name of the production was Ain't Misbehavin'. Ain't Misbehavin' was coming to Broadway in 1978. And Nell was cast to be the star of the show. And honey, I do mean star. In fact, Nell Carter was a great big shining star in this play. When people came to this production to see the play, they came for Nell and Nell knew it. She was the acting and singing God of this play. I mean, she really owned that sucker and every single night, every single performance, she hit the nail directly on the head. And nobody could deny what Nell had done and they didn't even try to. And when the Tony Awards of 1978 came around, Baby, them folks handed Nell her Tony Award just like them men be handing them women $40. Nell had done what she was supposed to do and she had done it right. In fact, she was so great. After that show, Nell was considered a star. She was a celebrity. And now that she was, TV roles were at her beck and call. And baby, Nell ought to be ashamed of herself, child. Baby, Nell was walking around the Broadway execs and all the playwrights and stuff talking about how Broadway was her life and, you know, she'd never forget it and it really got her to where she was. Was. Then them folks cast her as Effie White in Dreamgirls 1979. Nell went about two rehearsals and then next thing you know them folks received a letter from her agent talking about Nell had quit the show because it was interfering with her new TV work on a show called Ryan's Hope. Huh, and them folks was just a scrambling, calling Nell's phone, trying to talk to her, trying to ask her if there's any way that she can come back to the production, trying to tell her, you know, you promised that Broadway was this, this, and that. You know, Nell, we need you. We need you for this show. Child Nell was sitting on the couch sipping her wine looking at that phone ring like and I can't say I blame her at all because her goal was to see how far she could go in her career. Now, along with Ryan's Hope, in 1979, Nell also booked a role in the movie Hair. Then, in 1981, she took a role in the TV show The Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo. And even with all of these TV roles and things that were coming her way, Nell star was still shining because of her performance for Ain't Misbehaving. It was remembered just how well she was in the play version. They asked her to come back to the TV version of Ain't Misbehaving and Nell killed the role once again. So much so that she won a Emmy this time. And all of the TV presentations that Nell acted in, she did a swell job. So in the year 1980, when a show named Give Me a Break started going into production and for the starring role, it was pretty much a no brainer that the new black it girl with the fantastic voice and the huge acting chops would fill this role. So they asked Nell to come in, and in no time, Nell Carter became Nell Harper. She had booked the starring role of Give Me a Break. And Nell Carter, or the little girl, Nell Ruth Hardy, could finally breathe. Now everybody all over America and even other parts of the world would be able to experience the phenomenon named Nell Carter. And the only thing left to do now is get to the scandalous gossip and words on the street for Miss Nell Carter. Let's get to it. Now baby, listen at this. This first piece of gossip says that back in Birmingham when Nell was younger, she was friends with either one of, some of, or all of 
those four little girls who got bombed in the church in Birmingham. Gossip claims that she used to play with them, and so when they died, their deaths hit Nell very hard. This next piece of gossip says that Nell was such a shining star in her local community when she was singing on the gospel radio and singing at church, that when she actually decided to try for show business and started singing Not So Holy Song, that the people in her community, along with her mother, started to judge her very harshly. They basically said that she was doing the devil's work and that she was sliding into sin. Baby, the gossip says that even certain pastors and preachers, not gonna name no names, would even stand up in the pulpit and preach full messages against Nell. Pretty much using her as an example of what happens when the devil gets a hold of the youth. But child, some of these folks out here said that the pastor might have been right, honey. Baby, them folks say Neil Carter got up there to New York and fell prey to all kind of vices, honey. And one or two vices took her behind down through there. You see, Nell had been doing great on the theater circuit, AKA Broadway circuit. And when she got her big hit show, Ain't Misbehaving, she was suddenly invited to parties and had access to people and things that she had never experienced before. See, the more popular you get and the more praise you get, you start hanging around with even more popular celebrities. People who party in a way that your country little tail ain't never seen before. And doing things that your country little tail ain't used to, especially back in them days. So Nell ends up going to a party that was held the night that she won her Tony Award. And of course, Miss Nell Carter is one of the winners of the night. So she is expected to really be the life of the party. All these big names and big wigs standing around and dancing around. And everything is super exclusive. No outsiders allowed. Everybody's just having a good time. Well, soon Nell finds out just why the crowd is all smiles and cloud surfing. It is because there is more going around that room than just joy and happiness. There's cocaine. Now, when whoever it was that approached Nell asked her to do a bump, it's possible that Nell may have hesitated, but it's also possible that Nell felt very pressured. I mean, come on, clearly some of these people in this room at this party with her are some of the same people who possibly cast a vote or put a whisper in somebody's ear for her to win that Tony Award. Also, some of these people in the room could afford her bigger and better opportunities. Who wanted to be a party pooper in front of these type of people? Who wanted to make these type of people feel like they were doing something wrong by saying, oh no, you know, I don't do drugs. Who really wants to do that? And Nell leaned in and she took the bump. And something terrible happened. Neil Carter ended up loving that bump. So from now on, and I hate to say this, but gossip claims that Neil Carter turned into a cokehead like you wouldn't believe. Said Neil was always somewhere walking around just smiling, eyes big, honey, always looking for her next high. And it's claimed that when she first started in her early years, she could control it. But as time went on more and more, she was having a very hard time controlling it. By the time she got cast on Give Me a Break, her addiction was super duper bad. Sometimes it's claimed that she would be so blow that she wouldn't show up to the set for an hour. And then when she did come, don't complain to her about her lateness. Cause it is alleged that she was not afraid to throw her weight around. She was definitely not afraid to let folks know that she was the star of the show. This doggone show wouldn't be nothing without me. And as Nell's success grew, the more out of control she became, not only with drugs, but with food. Maybe they said that she could really put it away, honey. And then after eating, Eating all of that, she would turn around and be uh, sad, mad, and depressed about her weight gain. And speaking of food, child, don't y'all mess with Nell when it comes to her doggone food. Baby, it's a rumor out here where somebody left a comment and said that they worked with uh, Nell on the set of the show Hair. And they said that they were sent to get Nell's lunch. So they uh, come back with Nell's lunch, hand it to her, and turn around to walk off and try got a flying kick to the back, honey. Nell has come out of nowhere with a roundhouse kick, baby. Them folks turned around and Nell was in their face cussing them out, all because they had gotten her order wrong. And to go into another rumor about Nell's drug use and on the set of Give Me a Break, it is said that one day she didn't show up like she always did, you know, when she was late, too hungover and all this kind of stuff, but hours and hours passed and Nell just never came. So casting director Joel Thurm sent somebody 
somebody, a crewman or somebody to Neil's house to check on her. They end up breaking into Neil Carter's house and find her unresponsive on the floor but naked child with a white mink on. And if you're wondering how Nell could get this high off cocaine, it is because she was spending a thousand to two thousand dollars a day, not a week, not a month, y'all, a day on cocaine. And on top of doing this cocaine, she also was drinking vast amounts of alcohol. Now in 1982, right after Give Me a Break really started to move numbers as far as ratings in the TV world, Nell ended up meeting and marrying George Kreinicke or George Kreinicke. And he was a mathematician and a lumber executive. And child of folks say that Nell and George's wedding was the talk of the town, honey. And gossip claims that it really was a freak show for back then. And when I say that I'm not trying to offend anybody and y'all will see why I'm saying this in just a second. I promise you I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just saying what the gossip was around town at the time. It was considered a freak show because in her audience, set a bunch of cross-dressers, a bunch of bisexuals, and a bunch of drag queens. And not only did Gossip claim it was a freak show because of that, it's claimed that it was even more of a freak show because of the bride herself. Nell was chugging down caviar and champagne like it was going out of style. She did a whole bunch of letting loose, a whole bunch of overeating, a whole bunch of drugs, and a whole bunch of alcohol. So much so, the Gossip claims that her and her husband couldn't even celebrate the night the correct way. Nell was in the bathroom the whole night with her head over a toilet bowl throwing up. Now, the word on the street is that after her marriage, Nell worried that her husband was happy. You know what I'm saying? She kind of really wanted to keep him happy. And one of the things she did to please him was to convert to Judaism. But even with Nell doing that, Gossip on the Street says that she and her husband spent more time apart than together. George always had to travel like abroad for some reason. You know what I'm saying? Every time you turn around, he was overseas. It was always something. And so a lot of the time, Nell ended up still very Lonely. And then something really bad happened, probably around 1983, 1984. And that is when Nell supposedly found herself alone in either an hotel room or her house. And she was sitting there and she was doing her drugs. And then all of her bad decisions and all of the things that had happened to her over her life just all came back to haunt her. And suddenly she felt very tired. You know what I'm saying? She was tired of having this drug problem, tired of drinking so much, tired of all this overeating, tired tired of trying to diet but never losing weight, tired of her husband not being there, you know, just tired. And then she started questioning herself because she was wondering, why am I having trouble with so much stuff? Why can I not kick this drug habit? And then she started to question her faith. She started to question if she made the right move, you know, converting to Judaism. You know what I'm saying? God, have I upset you? Like, God, are you abandoning me? She got so depressed that she tried to commit suicide. But now to get to another piece of gossip, this gossip involved Nell Carter's attitude. And although majority of people say that she was so sweet, she was so nice, there are some people out here that said Nell Carter could be a real nasty piece of work. Word on the street says that Patty Lupone was in a show with Nell Carter and Patty was straight terrified of Nell Carter. And it's claimed that it was because uh, Patty had seen Nell like going off on folks, said that nobody could even talk to Nell without her like going off and that she was like really mean acting and just had a bad attitude and said that uh, one time Patty uh, heard Nell threaten somebody with a knife. Then honey, they said y'all should have seen the way that Nell Carter used to treat Rosie O'Donnell. Now this is when Rosie O'Donnell became a cast member uh, of the show Give Me a Break. And allegedly Nell used to treat Rosie very nice, nasty like. Like if Rosie asked a question, Nell would be like, oh honey, honey, you don't know that. Now baby, you should have known the answer to that. Now I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not gonna kid you, that's a real stupid question. But honey, I mean, I guess, I guess everybody got to learn one day. It's real nice, nasty, you know what I'm saying? And it said that the reason that Nell was like this to Rosie O'Donnell is that she did not like the fact that Rosie O'Donnell was cast in the show. And there are also rumors on the streets about Nell Carter and her fights that she would have with Dolph Sweets, which was her main uh, co-star, the man that played the chief, Dolph Sweets, said that he felt like Nell was getting too uppity. He said he felt like her character was a servant, she was a hired maid, and that she shouldn't be talking to him like that. He was like, you know, I don't like this battling back and forth, and plus, what are the people in the South going to think? If you want this show to be popular, Nell has to pipe down a little bit. Honey, child, why did that man say that? Child, it's claimed that Nell Carter went slap 
off, baby, and told him that she wasn't nobody's servants. She wasn't nobody doggone made. She was his doggone equal, and she would continue acting the way she act. Then this next rumor talks about the little bust up that Neil Carter had um, that was involving the Pointer Sisters. And it was not that she and the Pointer Sisters had got into it or anything like that, but the Pointer Sisters had starred in an episode on Give Me a Break called The Return of the Doo-Wop Girls. Well, when they had flown in to rehearse for the show, Neil Carter was there on set and at the rehearsals, but she had been binging on something. But whatever it was, it actually put her down. She was not wired or anything like that. She was down and she was sleeping. And so the people in the rehearsals kept waking her up and she kept being like, okay, I'm ready. <sighs> and dozing right back off and they kept doing it constantly well then finally everybody got tired of her the pointer sisters got tired of her the uh directors everybody on set was tired of nail so they let her lay her tail on that doggone couch and they let her sleep the pointer sisters were live it honey because they felt like that their time was wasted they felt like that they flown in and this lady don't even have enough respect don't even have herself together enough to get through these rehearsals and then on the third day she wakes up to nobody around she's just lying on that couch in the rehearsal room and nell is mortified she go run to the director and the producers and whoever else she apologizes she's just like i'm so sorry i'm so sorry you know and she's like you know why didn't anybody wake me up you know where are the pointer sisters and the uh, directors told her straight out you know why we tried to wake you up you wouldn't wake up so we decided to let you sleep so you could see how ridiculous you were and of course like i said the pointer sisters were very upset so nell goes and rushes to them and she's like you know very apologetic and you know i'm so sorry i'm so embarrassed that this happened you know i'm getting myself together let's work on the show so anyways they did end up uh shooting the show and everything went smooth gossip also claims that nell was kind of bad with the kids on the show nell treated joey lawrence so, like that was her child you know what i'm saying she was very motherly joey was her little baby she couldn't wait to get to the set to see joey giving him all kind of money giving him candy and then he started getting a little older and he also started getting a little more screen time and Nell started treating that child like trash. Why this little boy so much doggone screen time? He's not that important. Who is the star of the show? Now, speaking of Nell being very mean and nasty, it was later found that she had diabetes. And some people have said that the reason Nell would get like that is because when her sugar was low, she was one of those people who would be burning with white hot rage. Oh, and then listening to this next rumor about Nell Carter. Baby, they said Nell liked to par tea honey it was very wild she did a lot of things she had a lot of sex with a lot of people and she was just wild she was just you know wanted to live that high life and then back to her drugs oh my gosh it was devastating at this time even after the suicide attempt Nell still did not get off of drugs and then one day she went to a Liza Minnelli show and when she was back in the hotel after the show Nell tried again to commit suicide Liza Minnelli was either in the room or she found out about it or something like that all I know is that she put Nell on a plane to a rehab center, like a big time rehab center. And Nell tries to walk in there, you know, I'm Nell Carter and baby, we don't give a doggone about you being Nell Carter. Get your behind in there and scrub them doggone toilets. Baby, we don't care about none of that. Get your behind in here and scrub this doggone floor. Them folks worked her about to death, honey. Did you wash those dishes? Like that was that kind of rehab center. And it's claimed that Nell did very well in that program, you know, and by the time she was was, uh, out of it she was off of drugs and she had even lost 91 pounds and if I'm not mistaken this happened in 1986 and so when she showed back up to the set of give me a break they wanted to take advantage of this new clean and sober and very slim and trim Nell Carter but unfortunately this change did not last long enough for them to do many episodes because once Nell got out of rehab she started eating just like she used to eat and she put back on the weight like that now I'm not sure if she started back drugs because I know somewhere in the late 80s, Nell Carter actually got clean off of drugs, but I don't know if it was right at this time. But anyways, what I do know, like I said, is that she continued to eat. And so people saw this slim trim Nell Carter blow back up and Nell, I guess, felt some type of way about it. So she would go on these TV shows and she would say, oh yes, honey, you know, I'm trying to get back on a diet. And then one time she done that mess and was looking crazy because she went on some TV show and was like, yeah, 
Yes, Nell Carter is about to go on a diet and lose weight. Baby, why come Nell was at like this pastry shop or something like that in real life, right? And so she had got like a donut or something and was about to eat it. Child, why come a customer and ran over there talking about some, no, Nell, stop it. Put it down, Nell. Just put it down. Child, they say Nell was so doggone embarrassed, baby Nell ran out the stove. Now, Nell's bad eating habits and just her unhealthy lifestyle anyway, like I told you before, ended up leading to diabetes. She also was still struggling with her marriage. George Kreinecke was just not the man that she wanted him to be. And so Nell told him that she wanted a divorce, but George spoke some sweet words to her. And so Nell was like, okay, you know what? Let's try it again. You know what I'm saying? Let's try it, but we need to love each other. Also, I want children. So she and George set to work. Nell ended up getting pregnant three times, but she ended up having three miscarriages. Even so, Nell still really wanted children. So she ended up adopting two baby boys. I do know that as soon as she acquired these babies, she and George did end up splitting up and they did divorce in 1992. But child, not even a few months later, Nell was already looking for another man to make her happy. And so she ended up marrying another guy by the name of Roger LaRock. And gossip claims that this whole thing was just bizarre. It's claimed that she met him and married him at like a little Vegas chapel at midnight one night you know and it's claimed that Nell was still going through a very bad depression you know she had gotten over 300 pounds at this point and you know it just kind of like everything just happened very hastily and really just probably was not a good decision and that's why she and Roger's marriage lasted like uh, not even a full year they got uh, married probably like mid 1992 and divorced early 1993 now now, even though I didn't really touch on it, Give Me a Break had ended by 1987. And by 1993, Nell really did not have much going on. She still had some acting roles here and there, but she was definitely not the star that she once was. And she was having a hard time dealing with it. And then all of this depression and all of this past drug use and just all of this negativity in her body and her mind manifested terribly for her health. Nell Carter suffered two brain injuries. Then in 1995, she had to end up filing bankruptcy because she had spent almost all of her money. Oh, and let me tell you, Nell was making $50,000 a week on Give Me a Break, but it's claimed the more she made, the more money she spent on drugs. And it really just did not look good for Nell. And then in 2002, Nell ended up seeing Whitney Houston with her Diane Sawyer interview. Child of folks on the streets claimed that Nell Carter started running around the house talking about, she gonna die, she gonna die, when she seen how Whitney looked. And Nell felt this so passionately that she she immediately jumped on the phone and claimed that she called Whitney's publicist, tried to get in touch with some of Whitney's family, heck, even called Whitney's record label to try to get in contact with Whitney or try to leave messages of things that Whitney should do. You know, basically saying that Whitney needed to get into a rehab or that she would die, she needed help. But uh, none of Nell's calls were returned. And it really seems like Nell had caught some sort of nurturing mother bug or something in the 90s and 2000s where she went wanted to like nurture people and help people because not only has she adopted her two boys but a little bit later she also tried to adopt two more children in one case Nell brought home a child named Mary she was growing attached to this Mary you know she had fallen in love with this little baby girl you know she was showing all of her friends taking all of these pictures but then Mary's birth parents demanded money up front money that Nell did not have. So the birth parents did not sign the adoption papers and they took their baby back. Then Nell got so desperate for a new little newborn that she allowed this pregnant woman that she really didn't even know to move in the house with her. Baby, that woman came in Nell's house, ate all her doggone food, drank all her drinks, used all her bars of soap, and then took her and her pregnant belly and left telling Nell that she didn't want to give up her child. Now, on the outside looking in, a lot of people could not understand why Nell wanted to take on the burden of raising all of these children by herself. You know what I'm saying? And also, she was not doing that well when it comes to money. But see, what they didn't know is that Miss Nell Carter was nowhere near alone. In fact, Nell had been getting her thing licked 
every doggone night. And no, baby, it was not a man doing the licking. Baby, the folks say that Neil Carter was in a very strong and very romantic relationship with a woman named Ann Kaiser. And Neil was supposedly completely in love with this Ann. Ann was actually helping Neil get back on her feet. You know what I'm saying? She was telling Neil that, you know, you still got it, Neil. You are a famous actress. You can get back out there and truly make something of yourself. And yes, we can have these children. We can raise these children. We can do this. We can be a family. And she really gave Neil a sense of stability. And this looked good on Neil. Neil Carter lost a ton of weight. She also now had a better handle on her diabetes. Neil now had something to live for. And yeah, Neil did have to file bankruptcy again in the year 2002, but this time Neil wasn't as half as worried as she was because see, now Neil was about to revamp her career. She was about to come back out, honey. In fact, slowly but surely, things had started happening for her again. The year before, she had actually starred in two episodes of Miss Allie McBeal, and then something huge happened. Nell was chosen to appear in a stage production called Raisin, and it was based on a raisin in the sun. And on top of that, she was preparing to be in a movie, honey, and this movie was called Swing. So Auntie Nell was back in the swing of things, and stardom was again calling her name. And on January the 23rd, 2003, she goes in her bathroom and she gets to powdering her face. She has places to be. But then, wherever Nell went, nobody could get in touch with her. While every Everybody is wondering just where the heck Nell is. Joshua ends up going to the bathroom and there is Nell dead on the floor. She was 54 years old and her death was ruled to be because of um, heart disease as well as some factors from diabetes. Very young and very tragic and kind of just the life of a woman who seemed to me like maybe she was looking for happiness. Maybe that's what it was. But at least by the end of her life, she was able to truly find happiness or gossip claims that she was with the uh, Miss Ann Kaiser. So anyways, this is the end of the old Hollywood scandalous tale of Mrs. Nell Carter. I have to go now because I have a lot of work to do, guys. But I love y'all so much. Bye.